So, shall we start a talk? Yeah, I think so. Mm. Oh, easy. Uh, I'm going to introduce Clive DeCarl. As I said, he's a, a, a friend of ours, I'd consider him. He's uh, one of the most knowledgeable guys on this alternative health that we're all looking at now. Do we trust the men in the white coats? No. You know, who's paying the men in the white coats? Mm. And Clive's been brave enough over the last few years to be... Um, challenging the uh, modern memes of cancer therapies and how do you cure diabetes and what do you do for old people when they're getting a bit of Alzheimer's so I'm going to introduce Clive he's got some brilliant YouTube videos so you can catch up on what he talks about today because um, sometimes it's a bit of a mass of information and you can review it afterwards so he's done some brilliant talks with <laughs> Luke Collins on the UK column and there's also a massive amount of YouTube uh, Presentation. So let's say welcome, Clive, and uh, thanks very much. Uh, can you hear me without this, or shall I use the microphone? <coughs> well, great. Um, I'd like to start off by dispelling some of the medical myths because you know one of the big problems that I see all the time is people who are eminently sensible, clever, uh, should know better go to the doctors because they've got what they think is a disease and most diseases uh, aren't diseases they're just a set of symptoms and it, I, I, I want to try and spell out how, how they've tricked us all uh, when I was young there were two really frightening diseases uh, gonorrhea and syphilis now syphilis has sort of disappeared off the planet so they say they claim that the vaccinations that the or, or rather the um, penicillin cured syphilis and we don't see it anymore but this isn't true this isn't true a they lied about the vaccines that never worked anyway but B the syphilis hasn't gone away now it turns out that lots of the uh, so-called diseases like arthritis and lupus are actually syphilis uh, over 20% of all the lupus uh, patients uh, actually have syphilis when they test for it, but the doctors are told to ignore the test. The doctors are told that it's a false positive and actually it's lupus. So um, a similar things happen with polio. Now in, in India, before Bill Gates, there were something like, I, can't, I may not have this number right, something like 45,000 children every year who contracted polio. They gave the vaccine and now claim that they've eradicated polio in India. However, uh, out of the blue, a new previously unseen disease called non-polio encephalitis uh, is uh, being contracted by exactly the same number of the people that used, used to get the real thing. And by just by switching names, they can do a rather wonderful job. And one of the key ones uh, that they fooled us with is HIV. Now, uh, if I were to ask you how many of you know that AIDS is a disease, probably quite a few of you would put your hands up, but of course AIDS doesn't exist. AIDS was simply the symptoms of the drugs they gave for HIV. So all those people that you saw wasting away, if you're old enough to remember what happened, and dying, they were dying of chemotherapy. They were not dying of HIV, which is, is a real virus. But let's say that you've got um, a virus. It could be a cold, could be a flu, could be smallpox, could be anthrax, could be, you name it, any virus. And you want to overcome it in hours, not either die from it or spend weeks recovering. How would you do that? Well, the first thing you'd do is start taking massive doses of vitamin C. First of all, you'd work out what your tolerance level is to vitamin C because, you see, you ask a doctor, they say, oh, you don't need more than a gram, you're just going to pee it out. But um, this isn't at all true. Most people that are well are probably needing something like four grams a day. Uh, of course, you could be eat eating the, the vitamin C, but most people aren't. Most people have actually got mild scurvy and don't know it. But let's say you're really ill, you've got cancer or something like that, then the dose you may need daily might be as high as 200 grams a day. Now, back in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, lots of medical doctors were experimenting with high doses of vitamin C. And they used to use it uh, intravenous. 
and some of them were going up to 200 grams of vitamin C intravenously in a 24-hour period. That's like a big sack of sugar into the arm every 24 hours. So what sort of results can you expect? Well, uh, let's say you've got pneumonia. Uh, there are people, and you can watch this on YouTube, uh, Dr. Andrew Saul has a video, How to Reverse Pneumonia in Three Hours, where he explains how he got run down, got pneumonia, and he, st he first of all, he tested himself to vitamin C tolerance. He took enough, not so you get diarrhea, which you would if you took too much, but enough so that he felt his, his tummy gurgling, right? He then backed off from that a little bit, and that amount turned out to be two grams. So he took two grams in water every six minutes. Within three hours, his temperature had dropped three degrees to normal and his fever had stopped. You know, if the doctors were taught how powerful vitamin C is when you use it correctly in the right dose, well, then antibiotics and vaccines wouldn't be required anymore, generally speaking. Certainly vaccines wouldn't. So. What else can you do with just vitamin C? And vitamin C is incredibly cheap, obviously. <coughs> well, you can restore your eyesight to some degree with vitamin C. Quite a few people uh, now read two lines better than they did. You can reverse heart disease in certain instances with vitamin C. And heart disease is one of the other big ones where they fooled everybody. Pretty much everybody believes that heart disease is the leading cause of death. And the statistics say that over 50% of you will die of a heart-related problem. But this is far, far from the truth. 150 years ago, maybe 1% of the population had a heart problem. Maybe 1% of the population had cancer. Now it's more like 50. Uh, lots of other diseases like um, type 2 diabetes barely existed. Um, Professor Alzheimer, 70 years ago, hadn't seen the brain-wasting disease that he had to call after himself. It didn't exist back <coughs> then. So, with heart disease, they do a lot of lying. They tell you, they tell some people, oh look, you've got a blocked artery, and unless we do bypass surgery, you're going to die. And they show you um, a picture of your heart and there you can see the artery and what they do is they put in colored dye and you can see the colored dye then it gets to the blockage and then uh, the dye continues down now when you see one of these live they're called an angiogram when you see an angiogram live what should happen if it's what they say they say look your arteries are 98 percent blocked we can show you in this picture so a blocked artery would be like having a hose with water putting your foot on it and now it's just a trickle coming through. But when you watch the dye being inserted, as it gets to the blockage, what should happen, like your foot on the, on the hose, there, there should be a, a sort of like a, a swelling, like a balloon blowing up, and a little trickle coming through. What you actually see is there is no delay. Although it's blocked, instantly the lower half of the artery is, is filled with blood. How does that happen? because the body has already repaired the damage that they say you have. Because the body makes little collateral blood vessels to bypass the blockage. Uh, otherwise, you, you would have been dead by now. And, um, but the doctors insist on doing an operation for something that the body has already mended. Yes, there was a problem earlier on. Why did that person get that blockage? Now, that's the issue that the doctors ought to be looking at, but don't. So hundreds of thousands of people are maimed because of unnecessary heart surgery. So w what is a heart bypass surgery? W what do they bypass exactly? Well, I'll tell you one of the things they bypass, and that's your brain, which means you're going to have oxygen starvation to the brain, which means that everybody who has a heart operation uh, where they bypass the brain is going to come out uh, with brain damage to some degree, whether a little bit or a lot. Um, can brain operations say I'm sorry, can heart operations save lives? Well, yes they can, but they shouldn't be thrown about willy-nilly in the way that they do. So let's say that somebody <laughs> has got a, an issue with their heart. Let's say they realize they've got high blood pressure, for example. Now what the doctors would do is they'd say, Oh, you've got high blood pressure, here are some drugs to bring it down to what they call normal. But I don't see that as a solution to any problem. That's dealing with some numbers 
which somebody has decided are your numbers and are applicable to you. The way I see it is if your body chose to raise your blood pressure, there's a very good reason why it did it. Now let's say that you are eating an awful lot of toxins, you're not drinking enough water, which is most people, and now your kidneys have got a problem, right? So you've got a kidney problem, what's the body going to do about that kidney problem? Well, the easiest route for your body to do is to turn up your blood pressure, so more blood is now going through your kidneys so that they can do their job better. You know, your body does not go wrong. The doctors are taught in medical school that your body does go wrong. They're taught that after a certain time, because of genetics, because of old age, because of these things just happen, which I've heard a lot of doctors say is the reason, um, they're told that they're clever and they go to school for so, lo so many years because they learn how to be cleverer than a human body is. Now, um, a human body has, is doing hundreds of millions, probably hundreds of billions or, or trillions of actions every second. You know, all your cells are completely, inde you know, they're, they're, they're completely independent, each one. You've got a hundred trillion of them and they're all doing stuff all the time. Now, a doctor, on the other hand, if you ask them to do 100 trillion actions in a second, you know, just try asking them to juggle. You know, three balls, four balls, they're not going to cope with it. Give them a trillion, they're really going to have problems. But they believe that they know better than your body, and, and that this is a farce. It, it's clearly a farce. So how do they get away with it? Well, um, the biggest advertiser in the world, in the media, you don't see it here in England, because it's not allowed, but everywhere else, the biggest, ma the biggest advertiser in the media is the pharmaceutical industry. So the newspapers, the media, are never going to write something bad about their best customer. They, re they really aren't, and that's why in the Express or the Mail or whatever newspaper, uh, you know, every week uh, there's a new cure for cancer or a new cure for something that's going to, in the future, uh, change our lives for the better. If only we take this drug now, when we get older we won't get Alzheimer's or whatever. So they, they've got 13 million people, I believe the number is, in this country so far on statins. That's a huge number, something like a fifth of the population, on a drug which doesn't work. Uh, I interviewed um, recently a Harvard-educated medical doctor. Uh, she was the brightest of the bright. And um, she looked at statins, she researched them big time, and she told me that you'd have to live at least 1,250 years to get, to get one benefit out of every 600 people. Right? So if any of you are planning on a long life, statins could be for you, but the odds are really against it. And the problem with statins is you're reduce, reducing the cholesterol in the arteries. That's why they give them to you. Uh, but again, they're assuming that your body doesn't know what it's doing. Now, let's say that your arteries were cracking up and they might split and burst and you'd die. Let's say that that was a possibility. Why, why would that happen? Well, vitamin C deficiency would uh, cause that. Because if you've got mild scurvy, that's where your body begins to crack up. You know, the most vulnerable part of you we wouldn't want to crack would be the main artery. So it doesn't matter whether you eat cholesterol or not in this instance, the liver can make cholesterol. The liver does make cholesterol. And if your artery is in danger of splitting, the liver makes cholesterol and lines the artery from the inside as a protective layer. But the doctors tend to shoot the messenger. They, they look at the pictures, they say, your arteries are full of cholesterol, the cholesterol is the problem. So they give statins or other drugs to reduce the cholesterol and they end up damaging people. If you col reduce cholesterol, uh, you're likely to have kidney damage. You're likely, you're likely to have, have blindness. There are a whole number, uh, oh, uh, and men won't be able to function properly anymore. There are a whole host of reasons why nobody wants statins. Yet people just blindly go along with it because the doctor said it's what they need. And, um, you know, do they, does anybody on the planet need a statin? Well, I can guarantee you that you're all going to be low on one or two vitamins and minerals. You know, we all are, because the food's rubbish these days compared to what it should be. So you're all low on vitamins and minerals, but I can guarantee you not one of you is low on a pharmaceutical drug. You know, your body just isn't crying out for it. No, we are, because we aren't taking <laughs> um, I've, I've got some um, nice brain drugs for you later. <laughs> so, 
but doctors say you are low, you are low on drugs, but how, how, then, you know, obviously that can't be. So let's look um, at another subject, uh, cancer. Now, um, I learned this also from the same Harvard-educated medical doctor. Um, she asked me, um, how many people after five years are going to still be alive if they've been diagnosed with colon cancer but they've done nothing at all? Now, you might want to ask yourself that question. You know, if I, somebody gets diagnosed with colon cancer, they, they do nothing, what's their five-year survival rate? Um, she said, 100%. It's such a slow-growing cancer that even the doctors don't rate it for 10 years. But because we believe that any cancer is going to kill us by next Tuesday lunchtime, people will say to their doctor, what can you do for me? I've got colon cancer. Now, uh, she explained that what she tells her patients to ask her that question... Uh, you, you see, let me explain. A cure... The, a doctor would describe a cure as you're still alive after five years. You might be in a wheelchair with no hair, no brain, no liver, on dialysis, but you, you've been cured. If you died one minute after the five years over, that's st you were still cured. Okay. So uh, she says that uh, she tells all her colon, um, uh, colon cancer uh, patients, look, if I told you there was a 90% chance that I that I could cure you, would you be happy with that? I said, yeah, yeah, I'd be happy with 90% chance. So well, look, I can tell you, you're already cured. You're not going to die in five years, it's impossible. Um, you're already cured. And it turns out when you look at the statistics of people who do nothing with colon cancer as opposed to people who, d who don't have colon cancer, the people with colon cancer live one year longer. It's actually a, um, a biological advantage to have colon cancer on average. And prostate cancer is very similar. Very, very similar numbers. It's not 100%, but it's, it's very close to it. Some, some cancers are very aggressive and will grow very, very, very quickly. Others are incredibly slow. But we just all, we lump them all together, don't we? So how many, how many people diagnosed with cancer actually have it? Well, not many, not many. Uh, they are misdiagnosing all sorts of things as cancer. Now, I saw one the other day. You know, people, people come to me not to be cured of anything because uh, I can't cure anything. Doctors have the, uh, uh, the that's, that's, that's the three words you can't use. Cure, um, uh, uh, that you can't talk about. Uh, the words cure, cancer, and there's another C word you also can't use. The, um, so I had a client come to me. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Even doctors on yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, only you can cure yourself. So, anyway, this chap came to me to get his health back, and the doctors had diagnosed um, colon cancer. And what had happened to him is that within a few uh, short months, uh, he'd gone from absolutely no symptoms at all to a whole host of terrible symptoms. So, it obviously, it wasn't colon cancer, because it doesn't happen that, doesn't happen quickly like that. He had IBS, or... You know, Crohn's, or he, he had some bowel problem, not what they said it was. And um, this happens all the time, particularly with breast cancer. You know, at autopsy, it turns out that everybody has had cancer at least half a dozen times in their life, never knew they had it and got over it, right? Autopsies prove that. So what if you've got one of these cancers and it's going to it's going to heal itself. You're never going to get a symptom, but you happen to go for an annual screening test, and they test test you, and you, oh my God, you've got cancer, right? Now the shock of hearing it um, alone in the one week after a cancer diagnosis, the chance of dying from a heart attack goes up 25 times because that stress, you know, it's the death death stress. And what happens when you get stressed, and all of us do. Uh, obviously all the time in this modern world, the first thing that happens is that magnesium and vitamin C are massively depleted in your body. Right? That's what stress does. So I can guarantee that all of us pretty much are going to be low on vitamin C and, and magnesium because we're all living a life of stress. So this wrong diagnosis thing is, pr is very, very convincing. They tell you 
look at all these people, they died from cancer, right? No, they didn't. They died from the chemotherapy. They died from the radiation. They died from the surgery. All the, whether they die from a, a drug mistake or cancer, it's still classed as cancer. Once they've had the diagnosis, whatever they die of, basically, it's, and so we now believe that 50% of us are likely to get cancer. No, it's not like that. It's not, if, if you don't uh, get treated by the doctors for it, your chance of living is really, really, really good. Um, one of the problems is diagnosis. I mean, let's say that uh, uh, somebody's worried uh, they've got cancer and they submit to a biopsy. Now, just imagine you've got a poison in your body. Let's say you've been eating some food and there were chemicals in there and your body has no idea how to rid itself of those chemicals. What, what's a body going to do? Well, the easiest place to park toxins out of the way of your brain, out of the way of your important organs, is to park it in fat. So lots of people who say, you know, I really don't eat very much, but I can't get rid of this stubborn bit of fat. Well, that stubborn bit of fat is saving your life because if it let, that, if it let the fat go, the toxins would come out of your bloodstream, you'd feel ill, it's got no choice. So let's say it can't park it in, in, in the fat for some reason. Where else could it put it? Well, one, one of the ways that the body actually, well, let, let's just go through the way the body does get rid of uh, toxins. I, I realize you're getting a bit blinded by the sun. Do you want me to move to another spot slightly? Um, no, it's fine. You, you're right. Okay. Um, so let's say you, you yeah, so, so the ways the body does get rid of uh, toxins, it might give you a spot and it ejects it. It might lock it up in a cyst or it might put, it, put them in a tumour. Now, you know, the, the, the doctors use the term uh, an encapsulated tumour. It, it's encapsulated. Now, imagine you've got the grain of sand in the oyster. Well, the oyster encapsulates it uh, with a pearl, supposedly to stop it irritating itself. What if toxins come into the body and there's no other way they can't breathe it out can't excrete it can't sweat it out uh, can't put it in the fat so it locks it up in a tumor and sometimes the tumor's there for the rest of your life Some, sometimes the body will eject it uh, literally uh, and you see this with with breast cancer sometimes that uh, the breast literally opens and if people don't die in the process there have been many cases where the tumor has just gone plop and dropped out the, bo the body literally had no other way to get the toxins out but to eject the whole tumor so um, you go for a biopsy what do they do they puncture with a big needle uh, the seven layers of protect protection around the tumor and as they pull the needle out they spread the toxins into the rest of the body this is not a sensible idea you know, more people die from being tested for colon cancer than they do of colon cancer. The test is more dangerous uh, than the cancer itself uh, in, the, you know, in the first five years. So why would you submit yourself to a cancer test ever? Mammograms squeeze and damage the breasts. They, they've known in Denmark, I think it is, or Finland, for over 20 years that uh, mammograms, A, don't predict anything valuable, and B, they cause cancer. They actually cause them. Radiation and crushing causes cancer of the breast. You wouldn't want to do that. So the trick is to take control of your own health and to realize that essentially, uh, as this gentleman said, you repair yourself. It's about your immune system. You know, you could walk through uh, a leper colony, hug and kiss everybody on the lips, if your immune system is strong. You don't have to be frightened of viruses. Viruses are not going to hurt you. It's a poor immune system that is, is going to be your, your problem. And how do you get a good, strong immune system? Well, our ancestors knew how to do it. It was easy. They ate locally, seasonally. Uh, you know, they grew it themselves. There wasn't the transport. So they couldn't pop, pop, pop down to Deathco or whatever your local supermarket is. You know, all the supermarkets have got these giveaway names like Deathco. Um, there's um, All Die, <laughs> very famous supermarket chain. And uh, so, uh, so what's gone wrong? Obviously, the food's gone wrong, and there are a lot of toxins in the environment. How easy is it to correct that? Well, if you've got some money, it's pretty easy. You can find your local biodynamic, organic 
super orgasmic farmer and uh, get stuff from them. Uh, you can grow it yourself, but unless you're growing old varieties, are you getting any goodness out of the food? Well, the problem is that, um, you know, let's say a, a farmer brought out two bulls. One is a prize bull, sired thousands of calves, fantastic animal. Then there's a sterile bull. Never, yeah, you know, it's hopeless. Now, which is, which is the healthy one? Well, it's obvious which one's the healthy one, right? But what about a grape? When I was young, grapes had things called seeds in. Cucumbers had seeds and everything had big viable seeds you could plant. But we're being fed seedless bull, seedless grapes, and we sort of think we're, that that's okay, that the nutrition must be there, but it can't be. If it's too weak to even reproduce itself, that's not really food. It's just food-like. So um, I came to the realization some time ago well, 30 years ago, I came to a big realization because I'd been fit and healthy up until that point when suddenly I made a big error. I decided to go to the doctor and I explained to him at 30 something, I'd got these spots on my face which were embarrassing me. What could the doctor do? He gave me antibiotics, which was really stupid. And I ended up in hospital. And by that time I got arthritis so badly, I couldn't put my shoes and socks on. I got the gun type one diabetic. Uh, I was in isolation ward a part of the time because they thought maybe I got tropical disease. I was falling to pieces. And at the end of several weeks in hospital, they said, well, we, we don't know what caused this, but we can operate and give you drugs. <laughs> and while I couldn't, I was too weak to hold heavy books, but I could hold light books. And I, I read one uh, which explained everything to me that I was low on vitamins and minerals. And I got wheeled out of the hospital after a few weeks, take to somebody who talks about what I talk about now, he gave me a bundle of vitamins and minerals and all the arthritis went away. You know, I looked like I was 90 years old, you know, knobbly, bony bits all over the place, it all, it all just went away. You know, I hadn't, my body hadn't gone wrong, my body had just run out of the nutrients it needed to make a perfect version of me. And that's pretty much everybody. You know, you don't catch fibromyalgia, you don't catch arthritis. Uh, all the autoimmune diseases would be better entitled nutrient deficiency and toxicity diseases. Because, you see, there are only three reasons really why the body can ever go wrong. And those three reasons are physical accident. You know, you've got a physical accident, well, you can fix scars, you can do all sorts of things with natural means. So there's physical accident, then there's toxicity, then there's nutrient deficiency. There is no fourth reason. Doctors will tell you there is a fourth reason, but there isn't. And that's toxicity. Uh, and thoughts. You know, we were told at school that we'd never amount to anything, we were rubbish or whatever it was. That's a toxic thought. You know, toxic thoughts can kill you. So, um, on that basis, what should one be doing to safeguard one's health? Well, let me run through the real basics. You know, we've already, already covered vitamin C and it's very dose specific. So vitamin C is, is vital. It's so important for, for, for everything. Um, so the most important mineral of the lot is magnesium. By a long way, magnesium is the most important and magnesium is woefully deficient in the foods that we're eating. They've even removed it from salt. You know, you go down to the seaside, real salt is damp and gray. And the reason it's damp is it's full of magnesium. So the companies who make the white fluffy salt, they remove the magnesium and the other water-loving minerals, and uh, now you've got left with an incomplete dry salt. And people believe they're buying sea salt thinking it's the real stuff, but it's not. And so all those warnings you had about don't eat salt, that was just to do with the wrong type of salt. You eat real dried sea and blood pressure comes down if it's high, balances upwards if it's low, uh, salt is the most valuable of all the multi-minerals you could possibly get. But it's the magnesium that's missing from the food that's really killing people wholesale. So the symptoms of magnesium deficiency, a lot of you will be familiar with. Uh, hiccups is one of them. Uh, muscle cramps is one of them. Restless leg is another. Anxiety, panic attacks, 
There are a whole host of things that magnesium does in the body. It makes it, ha it makes about 300 enzyme systems in your body work properly. Without, without magnesium, you're going to fall apart. You could become arthritic, a whole host of problems. So magnesium is my favorite single mineral because it works in minutes. Uh, I've had people who've said things like, well, I haven't been able to bend down, bend my knees for six years uh, because of the arthritis. I've given them bottles of, a bottle of magnesium, said so rub it on your knees, uh, and they've come back and said after doing it twice, they spent all day bending down gardening, right? So how much did, did that magnesium cost them? Uh, well, if they were buying it in a bottle, the amount they used would be 10p, right? So again, how can the doctors and the pharmaceutical industry make any money at all w with a cure that costs 10p? Yeah, that's just no good. It doesn't make anybody rich. So, um, how much magnesium do you, do, you, do you need? Way more than they tell you. If you went to the doctor and said, look, I've got those symptoms, I think I'm low on magnesium, what's the doctor going to do? He's going to give you a blood test, right? And he's going to come back and say, your magnesium level looks fine or maybe it'll even be low. But a blood test for magnesium is a total waste of time. You don't want to know how much magnesium has got, is in the blood. You want to know how much is in your cells. Whole different test. But the doctors do half a day on minerals and vitamins and amino acids and nutrition. And even then they're taught the wrong stuff. So you go to the doctor and, and you say, I think my iron levels are high low what, or any of it. You think they know what they're doing. You think that when they, when they read, they look very serious and say, oh, a bit low on this, a bit high on that. You think that they've been taught this stuff. No, they just, it says on the, on the sheet what, where, where you should be and what you are. It says what, virtually what words to say to you. It, it's, it's all a con. They don't know what they're doing because they can't make money from drugs. Uh, sorry, from uh, uh, minerals and vitamins and nutrition, so they don't even try. You know, if, if a doctor said to you, I think what you need are Brussels sprouts and blueberries, they get struck off because they're told exactly what they have to, you know, they have to give chemotherapy, radiation or surgery. Blueberries aren't in there. No. And if, you know, because they're told what to do by NICE or, you know, in America, uh, the other lot, um, they can get struck off if they don't follow the rules. So um, if you want radiation, surgery or drugs, go to a doctor. If you want health, a subject that they don't study, go and see somebody who knows about health or go on Google. You know, if you put your problem, let's say somebody's problem is arthritis, you put in arthritis natural cure onto Google, and while there will be a couple of sites which are the pharmaceutical industry pretending to be quack watch or somebody, uh, there, will, there will be the answer on page one of Google. Right now, all the natural cures are right there on Google, easy to find. And yes, it's confusing uh, when you're, because when you, there are different you know, one person says this is the way, another person says that's the way. Um, and probably they're all right, because there are hundreds of ways to get your health back. You know, you can go herbal, you can go supplements, you can go food, you, can, you know, lots and lots of ways to get your health back. So um, one of the issues I find is that some people say, uh, what well, some people experience is you know, they had cancer or something, they followed, say, an alkaline diet, and now they write blogs saying an alkaline diet is the only way to go. And you have to be quite careful of the sort of missionary zeal of some people. You know, a vegan diet cured them, therefore a vegan diet is for everybody. And funnily enough, one of the health experts, far more, uh, uh, you know, really quite a well-known guy in America, he's just come out publicly and apologized to everybody because for the last six years he's been telling them to go vegan. And when he almost died, he had to go on back on to meat. And he's, you know, he's really famous for being a vegan. You know? um, and you know, my opinion is, unless you are from the planet Vega, uh, a vegan diet is a seriously dangerous thing long term. Yes, you can recover your health on a short term vegan diet, but a lot of vegans re really get ill because they run out of B12 and they've got all sorts of issues. You've got to be really on the ball to be a vegan successfully. Um, and the same is true for vegetarianism. Uh, I gave up meat for 25 years until I decided to change my mind. And one of the reasons I changed my mind was that about uh, 15 or so years ago, I briefly 
got into the lie detector business. I was very interested in voice analysis and I teamed up with some people who had the software which could read your mind. It wasn't, uh, it, it, it was very interesting software anyway. Um, uh, I can't remember where I was going with that story. Oh yeah. So I contacted who was at that point then the most famous man in America who used lie detection. His name was Cleve Baxter. He was a really nice guy in his 80s or 70s at that point. And he sent me uh, a book that he'd written called Primary Perception. And this was in the 1960s he'd written this book. And what he decided to do, he had a big rubber plant in his office and he, he thought he'd clip the uh, clips of his lie detector onto the leaf of the rubber plant and he was just thinking I wonder what would happen if I cut one of the leaves off with a pair of scissors when the lie detector responded and he realized that the plant had just read his thoughts <laughs> so he went from there to do a lot of other experiments he was concerned that maybe it was the observer effect and the fact that he was watching it uh, might have it so he made sure he set up experiments at three in the morning and he'd have a little robot arm that would pour boiling water on some live shrimps. And at the second that, that happened, the plant responded. Right? He then got pots of live yogurt, split them into two, put the probes of the lie detector in one pot of yogurt, poured boiling water on the other pot of yogurt in another room, and you know, the other half of the yogurt went mental. <laughs> he then started taking saliva from people's mouths putting it on the fastest jet and flying it as many hundreds of miles as, as possible, putting the probes in the saliva, affecting the person in the office, and the saliva would react. So he proved a number of things all at once. A, everything's got consciousness. B, everything uh, knows what you're thinking. Blade of grass, doesn't matter what it is. And so I ca came to the realization that, OK, killing animals is not a great idea, and I wouldn't want to do it personally and all that, but uh, if it's all got consciousness, it's all got consciousness, and this planet is the great eating. You know, everything's eating something else. You know. uh, that's how it works. So, um, one of the big cons that a lot of you all know about is when they started um, telling people to eat low fat and eat low cholesterol. You know, that this was a disaster, and this is when Professor Alzheimer had to. Call, call this new disease Alzheimer's and it coincided with the invention of margarine and the new processing uh, of oils that they did. You know, oils used to be pressed between stones, you know, sunflowers, you just get, you know, olives, whatever, big stones, you press the oil out. Then they developed high pressure pumps and uh, high temperatures to extract much, much more oil, but destroyed the oil in the process. And as your brain is made primarily of water and then secondarily of fat, primarily cholesterol, Everybody who followed a low cholesterol, low fat diet has got Swiss cheese where their brain ought to be. You know, this is Alzheimer's. It's a cholesterol deficiency. Uh, it may also, of course, have a mineral and vitamin deficiency and so on al along with it. But prim primarily, everybody needs to understand that your brain's made, made of cholesterol. And uh, so everybody's been eating low fat. Well, they've been damaging themselves big time. And it's also about the hormones. You know, you've got cholesterol everywhere. It's super important. And uh, so they say, oh, you know, but my cholesterol levels, I've got this, this level and it's high and this one and it's low, as if um, your body doesn't know what it's doing. You see, um, cholesterol, um, and, and actually a well-known uh, medical uh, neurologist told me this. She said, look, describing high and low cholesterol, one's bad and one's good, is like saying, look, there's hospital and there's a good ambulance that leaves the hospital but a bad ambulance that comes back it's a circulatory system it's, it's all balanced you know there's no such thing as bad cholesterol it doesn't work that way and, it, and as we mentioned earlier if your body chooses to increase the cholesterol there's a really good reason why it's doing it you don't want to mess with the cholesterol you want to fix the cause of why it decided to do it in the first place So um, let's look at what the essential nutrients really are. What's essential nutrient number one? Well, arguably, uh, it's love. Love is an essential nutrient. And I'm talking primarily about self-love. 
okay, as, as a starting point, you know, how, how many of you don't love yourself 100%? And probably quite a few of you. I, I, I had somebody yesterday, I asked them, out of 100%, how much do you love yourself? She said 4%. I mean, yeah, some people say 70%, but 4%, oh my God. And um, so I explained to her, uh, well, I explained to you, is that, you know, when do we learn our biggest lessons? Obviously, it's not when we have our big, biggest successes. We learn our biggest lessons when we have our biggest failures. And when we have our biggest failures, boy, do we pay the price, right? Now, you've all had big failures, somehow, somewhere, something in your life, more than once probably, and you've suffered for that failure. Okay, so at this point, you've already done the suffering, it's in the past, you've learned all the big lessons from it, you might as well just draw a line under now and forgive yourself 100% because you never did anything wrong. You know, it's not as though you thought, I'm going to make a huge mistake today. I mean, you might have decided, you might have decided that, but the chances are you thought you were doing the best thing and then it all went horribly wrong, right? So uh, we beat ourselves up for making a mistake we arguably probably never made. So if you could all uh, just kindly uh, forgive yourself 100%, then you can love yourself 100% again. You know, you paid the price. You know, you might just go reset everything to 100% love. Okay, what's uh, number two? Well, the, the number two most important nutrient is oxygen, because, you know, you can do without magnesium, you might have muscle cramps and you might feel, feel rubbish, but without oxygen you haven't got very long to live. Now the problem is, where are the trees, right? Um, it was only a few hundred years ago, and they know this from oxygen trapped in amber, that the oxygen level on this planet was over double what it is now. It was over 40%, now it's under 20% because the trees are gone. It's not CO2 or anything like that, it's the missing trees. So not only is there not enough oxygen, but we're sitting hunched in front of a computer. If, you, if I were to ask you all to stand up, for instance, you could take a big deep breath, lean just a little bit forward and you'll find that something like three quarters of your breathing is just restricted just by that little angle. So most of us hunched over, over a computer not breathing and then we're stressed so we're probably shallow breathing and panic breathing um, and when you haven't got enough oxygen all sorts of problems happen throughout your body. It's massive. So it's one of the reasons why exercise works, one of the reasons, because you're getting oxygen which otherwise a lot of people might not get. So if you're a mouth, a mouth breather, you want to try and uh, remember to breathe through your nose. Uh, nose breathers live longer. Um, if you have any uh, health problems, I'll tell you something to do that's free, that's really, really worth doing, which is to get some bricks or some books and prop the head end of your bed up by six inches. Right, so now you're on slight slant with your head higher than your feet. Now, how many of you, for instance, when you pitched your tent, did you decide to have your bed slightly on a slope downwards? You know, you might want to have a look as to whether any of you actually did that without thinking about it, and that given a choice of flat or a slight slope, I mean, obviously there's not much flat here anyway, but the, you know, it's unlikely that you would have parked your bed with your head lower than your feet. Um, so somebody told us that lying flat was the best way to go but you look at animals that's not necessarily the case and it turns out that if you're sleeping on a slight slope you're changing your blood pressure right your how it works is that you're decreasing the arterial pressure which is if you've got high blood pressure a good thing and increasing uh, the venous return which is also a really good thing so people for instance with varicose veins quite often within a month or so or less, they'll find their varicose veins uh, going down just because of the change in the venous pressure. You want to ask a question? No, no, I'm very sorry. All right, okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, so there are lots of other advantages about sleeping on an inclined bed. Um, uh, there's so many of them that I did a two-hour interview uh, with a guy on this subject who was a mine of information and uh, on YouTube, if you check out my videos, there's one called The Science of Healing Sleep, where it, where it explains it. But it's so effective, ridiculously effective for people. No, head higher, head higher, head six inches higher. And um, uh, as the guy, uh, Andrew Fletcher, his name is, uh, uh, said to me, 
you know, you can use bricks or you can use something really totally useless like old medical books. <laughs> so, let me tell you one of the other stories that Dr. Jennifer Daniels, the Harvard lady, told me. What happened was that um, uh, I asked her, uh, how long was it into your uh, uh, medical training that you had to cover, cover up for, for a death caused by one of your colleagues? And she said, right away. She said, we were so compromised, she said, at medical school. She said, the pressure was so great, the exams were so hard, that she said, uh, to save time, she only ate every other day. She just had to work non-stop. And she said the net result of it was she realized that she'd have to cheat. And everybody was cheating, right? All the doctors. So their morals, their ethics compromised really early on. They're covering up for mistakes and they're cheating. And you know, we think that the doctor knows everything about medicine. And yes, they're super intelligent. Yes, they've done six years or more of training. But, you know, imagine when, when we were at school or, or college, if we went to college, do you remember everything? Well, of course you don't. You know, we're assuming that the doctor remembers what he was taught about the gallbladder. Well, what if he got drunk and stoned that night afterwards and couldn't remember a thing about it? Uh, you know. Um, so she then went on to say about halfway through medical school, they dropped a, a real bombshell. They said to her, they said to everybody, you do realize that half of what we're teaching you now is wrong, but we don't know which half. And they explained that um, it was all right, though, because in the future, science would march on, and as their careers progressed, would work out which half is true and which half isn't. So now suddenly they're in this terrible situation where, you know, their patients, they, they realize there's a 50-50 chance that drug isn't going to work. In fact, you know, because drugs damage you uh, if they're the wrong ones. So now, now they're having to give a drug to somebody with a 50% chance it's going to damage them. Right? Now, this is a real ethical question for people, because they thought when they signed up at medical school, it was all going to be hunky-dory and all the drugs would work, or most of them would. But that, even that 50% was a big lie. Uh, uh, according to The Lancet, uh, on, only 11% uh, of drugs actually do what, do what they're supposed to, only 11%, and there's another report that says only 9% actually do what it says on the label. So, so once doctors realize that, they realize they've got a 90% chance of giving a drug and damaging somebody, and it's not going to work. So, but at that point, they've come out of medical school, their, their parents have invested loads of money, they're deeply in debt these days, deeply, deeply in debt, and they're now getting quarter of a million a year, uh, or whatever it is. Then you've got the private doctors. Now, I interviewed, I interviewed an oncology nurse, 17 years working in the cancer wards. I asked her, uh, <coughs> did you ever see drugs being given unnecessarily when everybody concerned, including the doctor, knew it wouldn't work for money? She said all the time. Imagine you are a uh, private doctor, private cancer specialist, right? Now, a round of chemotherapy, chemotherapy, and some people have 10 rounds, some people have even more, could be 20,000 quid, could be more, could be 40,000. What's your commission? How much are you gonna get out of that 20 grand? As your cut, right? In the old days, you know, the Chinese doctors were paid by the family when everybody was well. But one person in the family got ill, the whole, the, whole, the whole family stopped paying the doctor until they'd fixed that one person. Now, there's an incentive to get somebody better. But, it, but in the UK, the doctors are paid by how many ill people they're looking after. Where's the incentive to get somebody better when you get paid by the more ill people you're looking after? There, there, there doesn't appear to me to be an incentive. Then, when you add money into the equation, and you say to a doctor, look, I mean, I mean the cancer nurse explained to me it's like this. Uh, the doctor would justify it perhaps in their mind by saying well the person's going to die anyway maybe there's a slight hope it might work they know, they know it won't but maybe it's like hope they'll feel better if they're on drug you know feel at least they're trying and uh, then there's this 20% commission you know it's totally wrong it couldn't be more corrupt I think um, 
So, uh, you know, you go to a doctor and they give you a diagnosis. So what's the definition of a diagnosis? Well, gnosis from the Greek is to know, agnosis is not to know, so diagnosis is two people not knowing. <laughs> So take it back to magnesium. How should you use magnesium? Should you take a, a tablet or a capsule? Well, that would be pretty much a bit of a waste of time because you can't take magnesium orally in quantity without getting diarrhea. Now, if somebody was constipated, there are two main reasons why they might be constipated. Lack of magnesium and dehydration. How magnesium works is like this. If I want to contract my muscles, calcium has a lot, big part to play in it. If I want to relax them, or relax any other part of me, my mind, all my muscles, everything, magnesium is what does relaxation. So imagine somebody's constipated. Their, their bowels are like that. Now if they had magnesium, the bowels would release and the normal bowel movement would take place. But people who are constipated, generally speaking, are dehydrated and lacking magnesium. Um, so how to get magnesium in? If you take too much, you get diarrhea. Well, you want to fix constipation, just take too much magnesium. Uh, you know, Epsom salts, for example, which is magnesium sulfate. The, the, the older people will, will remember a, a phrase, it went through me like a dose of salts. And that's because they took Epsom salts and nothing's going to, you know, you've got to fasten your seatbelt and stand back. You know? <laughs> um, so how to get magnesium into you just normally? Uh, you spray it on the body. It comes as a liquid. You know, in the old days, people would, you know, you went to the doctor and they were sensible in the old days. They might say things like, well, what you need is the sea air, which is full of iodine, full of ozone, lots of great things about sea air. They might say, you need the mountain air. Well, up in the mountains before pasteurization, they'd be eating all that dairy. You know, the Swiss, who are the second longest lived people in the world in certain, certain valleys, that, you know, their main stay of eating was bread and cheese and butter and cream and stuff, and they lived a ripe, ripe old age. Uh, so they might send you up to the mountains for a cure, or they might send you to take the waters, you know, send you to a spa, Baden Baden, where for a week or two you'd bathe in the waters and be miraculously cured. So what was in the waters? Primarily magnesium. There are two types of bars. There's the, the hot springs that have the sulphur, but usually they, they were magnesium. So you go with a bit of arthritis, spend a lot of time in the water, and the sea is full of magnesium. So you spend time in the sea, spend lots of time at, at one of these spas, magnesium rich, all your problems go away, just like mine did in the arthritis. Magnesium is magic, absolutely magic. How many of you are low on it? I would suggest, I don't know, 95%, something like that, probably more, but who, who knows? So. Um, you can eat magnesium, of course. One of the reasons people crave chocolate is that it's rich in magnesium. I mean, there are lots of other reasons people crave chocolate, like all, all the feel-good, uh, happy chemicals. Um, <coughs> and uh, you know, with, if it didn't have the sugar in it, chocolate would be a fabulous, fabulous food. Um, so, uh, magnesium, you rub it on, or you have a bath in the stuff. But it, it, if you have a bath in the stuff, you need at least half a kilo to make it work. Just putting a little bit in will not work. You've got to get the saturation up sufficiently so that it's, it's going in. Um, you had a question? Is there two types of magnesium and one's better absorbed by the body and one's quickly ejected by the kidneys? Is urine? Is that true? Well, uh, um, th there's every type of magnesium salt. You know, you can get magnesium malate, citrate, uh, chloride, you know, uh, uh, you can get a magnesium salt of everything. And the best one, in my opinion, is magnesium chloride, which uh, is what's in the sea, primarily. But different, different magnesium have different things. Let's say you had a splinter, and it was really deep, and you, you just couldn't get it out, no matter what you did. Get some Epsom salts, which is magnesium sulfate, and make a paste. Put the paste over the splinter. In 10 minutes, a little tiny squeeze will come straight out. Epsom salts bring things out of you. So you have an Epsom salts bath. It's fabulous for detoxification. If you had a bath of magnesium chloride, it's particularly good for putting magnesium into you. Uh, a mixture of the two would be great. You could add bicarbonate of soda in the bath. Again, lots of it, like half a kilo. You could add citric acid. You could, there are all sorts of things you can add to baths which make them uh, anti-cancer, 
uh, just incredible. Uh, look at look at bathing in magnesium chloride, Epsom salts, uh, citric acid, and bicarbonate soda. Very very healing. You want to be as hot, hot as possible for about half an hour or so, and you want to do it uh, in the evening, not in not in the daytime. You, you, I've had people who said I've had the best night's sleep in 20 years after having a magnesium bath. Um, some time back, I was very, 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 very stressed and I was testing my blood pressure and it was really high for me. And I had a magnesium bath in about a kilo of magnesium and uh, uh, immediately, well, I tested it after I got out, blood pressure back to normal from worryingly high to just back to normal, boom. Uh, it's fabulous. You know, magnesium is the most overlooked of the minerals. Another overlooked one is iodine, which will improve your memory, will improve your thinking capabilities, your speed of thought. Uh, it plays a big part in correcting the thyroid, and at least 95% of you are going to be low on iodine. How much does it cost? About a pound a month. You know, it's just ridiculously cheap. And this is the problem with all these things I'm talking about. They're all way too cheap for the pharmaceutical industry. So, uh, I mentioned sea salt, uh, you know, to understand how important real sea salt is in World War II, when the Navy ran out of blood plasma, they'd often use seawater as a replacement for blood transfusions. Uh, you know, the, the difference between salt water and blood is, is almost negligible. The difference between chlorophyll in a plant and hemoglobin in blood is almost negligible. The only difference is in the plant the basis is magnesium and in us the basis is iron. Otherwise hemoglobin and chlorophyll are effectively the same. So uh, what, what should you be eating? We'll get back to supplements in a minute. What, what should you be eating? Well, in my opinion, you want to be eating what your ancestors ate. You know, some people said, oh, but you must be veggie, you must be vegan. Well, you try telling that to an Eskimo who's never seen a vegetable in their life. You know, they're just not going to do well on a veggie diet. And I don't think uh, a veggie is going to do terribly well on 90% blubber either. You know, it, it is down to what your ancestors ate. They were healthy. They didn't have doctors. Even if they did, how would they have got there? How they know the doctor? You know, it's um, our ancestors used herbs. They, if they got ill, I mean, obviously mainly they didn't because they were they were eating healthily most of them. But if they did, then herbs would be the answer. And the herbs are all still there. You know, there are all these people who are going to the doctor for heart drugs when the hawthorn leaves and the hawthorn berries are right there in their garden. They're going for all sorts of liver, kidney, whatever it might be issues when the dandelions, the roots and the flowers and the leaves are right there in their garden, the nettles are right there, nettle root, you know, all the really common weeds are fabulously, fabulously effective and useful. Um, and we're just walking right past them as if they didn't exist. Um, Supplement-wise, sunshine. Everybody needs to be aware of how important sunshine is. You know, the highest, people with the highest vitamin D levels have 80% less cancer, roughly speaking, than the people with the lowest vitamin D levels. You know, the sunshine from vitamin D is absolutely vital. You know, why do you get colds and flus in the winter? Uh, it's because we've run out of vitamin D from sunshine. And uh, when I learned that, it was a medical doctor who taught me that about 10 years ago about vitamin D. I've never had a cold or a flu since because got enough vitamin C, zinc maybe, and uh, you know, basically good diet and vitamin D, you're not going to get ill. Uh, it's, it's, or, or it's quite hard anyway. Um, okay, what else to do? Uh, sulfur is also missing from the foods that we eat. You know, there was never that much sulfur in the soil in England compared to some other countries, but there really isn't very much here, and uh, modern farming methods have depleted what there was. So why is sulfur important? And the uh, type of sulfur I'm, that, that, that I use is um, made from, it's a byproduct of the tree pulping, the paper industry. So it comes from pine. You, if you go into a place like Holland and Barrett, you can get another version, which is presumably made from petrochemicals, because Holland and Barrett is owned by the Carlisle Group, who are arms dealers and arms manufacturers. So is GNC, so is Puritan's Pride, so is Solgar. If you're using those products, you're trusting your health to an arms manufacturer. Okay. 
Uh, if you get good sulfur, and, it, and how it's distinguished is it's called organic sulfur, um, it um, dissolves scar tissues. So from a Chinese medicine perspective, if you've got a big scar from a cesarean or whatever it might be, that's affecting the Chinese energy lines, the meridian system. And by repairing the scars and sulfur dissolved scars, you can correct much more than you might think. Also, sulfur uh, is, a, is a fantastic detoxer. Let's say you've got a mercury filling in your mouth, a silver filling, and you've had it there for a long time. So mercury is now accumulating in your body, and your body, let's say, isn't very good at excreting mercury, so you've got an overload of it. Maybe you've lived in a house and there was a bit of lead in the pipework from years ago, now you've got a bit of lead poisoning, whatever it is. The great thing about sulfur is that when it meets a metal in your body, it binds with it and creates a sulfate. And so mercury sulfate, for instance, is water soluble. All the sulfates are water soluble. So you t you, you've got a, a metal that you can't get out that's damaging your brain, causing Alzheimer's, which uh, mercury poisoning can do. Now, for the first time, maybe for decades, take sulfur, turn it into a, merc in a mercury sulfate, pee it out. And uh, so sulfur is incredibly important in the scheme of things. Will you find it in your average multi-mineral? No, it won't be there. Would MSM be a good thing to take? For well, MSM is what I'm talking about, but the distinction is that most MSM is either petrochemical-based or it's being contaminated. What you want to do if you're ever taking MSM sulfur is you want to take it all by itself, not mix with anything. But if it's got anything in it, like titanium dioxide or magnesium stearate, these things that they put in the <coughs> encapsulating machines or the tablet machines so that the ingredients run through the machine smoothly and don't get blocked. They can do it without those things, but they have to run the machines much slower, so that's more expensive. So most of, you know, 90% or something of the health supplement industry has been taken over by Big Pharma anyway. So a lot of them have taken really good products that people love and work, then they've added titanium dioxide or something to it, and now it doesn't work properly anymore. And so this is, this is the point about trying to find suppliers who you can trust. And increasingly, it's a smaller, smaller marketplace, probably, as people get bought out. Ah. What would you say about the quality of this and where to get it? Okay, well, 98% uh, of the vitamin C on the market, or something like that, is made from genetically modified corn from China. So, uh, with all this stuff, now you just have to be awake, otherwise you're getting GM foods and you don't know it. So, you can buy non-GMO vitamin C, and at the cheap end, uh, ascorbic acid, which is the stuff they used historic historically, or sodium ascorbate, which is like ascorbic acid with a bit of bicarb in it, or you can get it from fruits like acerola cherry. <laughs> um, you know, one of the big uh, things on the internet, if you put in, uh, say, cancer cure and vitamin C, you'll see lots of people who've had intravenous vitamin C and recovered. The first time I ever saw cancer reversed was 27 years ago. My dad's best friend uh, was advised to take high doses of vitamin C. Uh, he recovered from cancer, lived another 25 years, and when he did die, it wasn't from cancer. So I've, I've, I've witnessed for decades now what vitamin C can actually do. But who wants to have, have an IV? And it's expensive. You know, I'll charge you a couple of hundred quid or something to have an IV if you do it, did it privately. But you can make your own virtual IV by mixing fat with vitamin C. And how to do it is you take equal quantities of the vitamin C you're choosing to use, doesn't matter which one it is, and you take uh, equal quantities of lesser thin. You can get soya lesser thin, which is, you don't want that, don't want anything soya. Uh, or you get sunflower or egg lesser thin. You mix the two together with water in a liquidizer for about 10 minutes. And now you've got what they call liposomal vitamin C, fat coated vitamin C, which bypasses the stomach, releases lower down. Uh, you don't get the sort of diarrhea problem you can get with mega doses of vitamin C and you can take about seven times as much in one go. So imagine that person who was taking two grams every six minutes for his pneumonia. He could, could have taken a lot more in liposomal form. So uh, there are lots of ways to use vitamin C cleverly. Uh, there are other ways as well. Um, 
other things that you that are really essential missing from food all of the trace elements you know what happened in the old days was that our ancestors cooked their locally grown seasonal food on a wood fire then they took the ashes and they sprinkled it on the veg patch doesn't matter where in the world you are this was just normal the ashes got recycled recycled forever because the trees did the mining you know hundreds of feet down bringing up all the minerals from all the different strata and then we burn burn those minerals minerals aren't damaged by heat and then they changed changed to gas ovens and electric ovens that was the end of the minerals being recycled like that then they changed to chemical farming you know in the old days they used to burn the stubble for instance at least that put some of the minerals back now they don't even do that anymore um, so we're all eating food unless it's on perfect soil that's, that's so minerally deficient it's ridiculous so it's not just the big minerals like the selenium and the magnesium it's the little elements you know that there are about 78 trace elements uh, which most people can't even know, don't even know the names of like yttrium and uh, you need those as well uh, the doctors on the other hand say no you don't they say for instance we've looked at the human being we've looked at the cells there is no yttrium in the human body that the human cells use and this is true why do we need it because the bacteria in our gut eat the yttrium and what they excrete is what we need so you know who, who are you are you the hundred trillion human cells in your body or are you that plus the thousand trillion bacteria viruses fungus and so on life forms that, that are in the rest in your gut you know you're outnumbered 10 to 1 by hitchhikers so if you're not looking after your internal friends you're going to have a problem you know they reckon that 85 percent of your immune system is the bacteria in your gut so if you're drinking chlorinated water if you're bathing in chlorinated water you've ever taken an antibiotic or you're on drugs from the doctors the likelihood is that the balance of your friends in your gut is going to be seriously compromised and if you look in the mirror and your tongue's got a white coating that's pretty much proof that your gut is compromised now if your gut's compromised that's a fungal overgrowth of candida by the way so when i was young gluten intolerance was pretty much non-existent i don't remember anybody having a problem with bread but nowadays almost everybody's got a problem with gluten and bread lots of people have but most people don't know they don't know they have um, what's happened is when I was young wheat was shoulder high now it's below your knees that hybridization has totally changed wheat it's not safe to eat anymore and the same is true to a lesser degree of all the grains including rice and what's happening is that the doctors give you an antibiotic that messes with your in intestinal bacteria now when you eat these modern wheats which are often super high in gluten if you want a spongy bread it's got to be super high in gluten and the proteins from that gluten can get through the gut lining and into your bloodstream now when that happens uh, you've got some serious issues going on and this is happening for a lot of people probably 50 percent of the population uh, have either got uh, a genetic predisposition to problems with gluten or they've created it much more likely by themselves uh, so a lot of people got leaky gut which allows these proteins through and this can cause arthritis and a whole host of different issues and so pretty much all of us need to repair our gut by eating fermented foods you know our ancestors to get through a cold winter would have been forced to eat fermented foods they would have had no choice cheeses wind dried hams beers pickles pickled vegetables whatever and now we don't get that anymore because we we go to go to the supermarket so the only way to repair your gut uh, is either to eat fermented foods or drinks put the bacteria back in that way or uh, you can do something called fecal implants and they're exactly what you think they are <laughs> and how this works um, Jennifer Daniels the Harvard educated medical doctor uses this you've got somebody who's got a very very damaged gut maybe they've got IBS Crohn's disease you know they could die they've got a really really ser serious uh, intestinal issue you can take 
the feces from somebody who has never had an antibiotic or, and is really well, and you can put it in a capsule and shove it up somebody's rectum. And I've seen people who've had really debilitating IBS, you know, hos hospitalization stuff, three weeks, boom, 95% fixed at least. Um, and he used, he used some from a friend. <laughs> um, but Dr. Daniels has been taking that further and making homeopathic remedies with it which are working. So you want to make a homeopathic remedy of anything, you put it in a bottle, fill it up with water, shake it about, pour it all out, rinse it out, that bottle 30 times, you've now got a 30x homeopathic remedy. Okay, you've washed that bottle 30 times, now you've got a homeopathic remedy when you fill it up that last time. So, what if you are allergic to gluten? How do you know? How can you tell? Well, the best way is to give it up for a couple of weeks or so and see how you feel. Some people, their life changes. Some people, it's a revelation. Two weeks with, without grains, and I'm talking rice, rye, oats, barley, wheat, the camet, spelt, the lot. Uh, a lot of people, you'd be surprised feel fantastic after two weeks off the grains and then what you can do before you try grains again oh by the way you mustn't cheat even once even if you <laughs> cheat once you have to go back to the beginning again because the test has to be ab about two weeks totally without it so if you cheat you've got to go back to the beginning so what you do after you've done that is you take your pulse sit down take your pulse see what it is then eat eat your favorite grain Whatever, whatever it is, in whatever form it is, and over the next 15 minutes, take your pulse several more times. If your pulse goes up, you're having an allergic reaction. It's that simple. Now, sometimes the allergic reaction can be noted after just one day without the thing. It doesn't have to be bread, it could be eggs, it could be cheese, anything you want to test. Sometimes just one day is enough for your pulse to race. Uh, other times, you know, it takes a couple of weeks. But it's, it's an interesting test and it's free. Um, would you guys like a little tea break, or should I just carry on? What's, what's the consensus? I can't, I can't hear a word. Uh, I've never done it, and I'd have to research that to, to ask, answer that question. So, go have a quick show of hands. Yeah, OK. So, uh, uh, let's have a, qu a quick tea break, and we'll, we'll come back in <coughs> ten minutes or, or whatever. Oh, is that right? Oh, well, apparently I've only got 10 minutes left. So in that case, uh, I'm going to get on to a couple of totally different things. One of the things that's been uh, on my mind for a long time is unemployment, right? So many people haven't got enough money, you know. I don't mean unemployment, I just mean not, not enough money, right? So I've got two possible suggestions as to how uh, people could make some money, and I'll t tell you what they are. One of them is the magnesium thing. What I find is if you give a little bit of magnesium to somebody who's over 50, there is at least a 50% chance that they're going to go, wow, that, that helped. You give it to anybody who's got an ache and pain, 90% chance, probably 100%, that they're going to say it helped. It's that effective. So what I'm having done at the moment, because I've, I've been making and selling magnesium supplements for quite a few years, so having it put into little sachets, like those little sort of shampoo-type sachets, so people can give them out to people without it costing an arm and a leg. I reckon I can get them done for, I don't know, 12p or some, something like that. So my idea was, let's say somebody wants a professional where they're going to feel good about themselves. They spend, let's say, 100 quid. They buy a bunch of sachets and I print them business cards with their name, address, uh, email address, whatever, uh, and a little description about what magnesium does and how to use it. So for 12 quid or something like that, you can go to the, the police station and get a hawker's license. That gives you the right to knock on the door and say, hello, do you get muscle cramps, twitches around the eyes, restless leg, panic attacks? So many people say yes to that question. You can then, you could either say, well, look, this has cost me 15p or something, or you can just say, look, why don't you take this with my card, two of them maybe, and give me a ring. If it makes a huge difference to you, expect to notice a difference in five minutes, right? And uh, so that, that's one idea. And then if the people like the product, want to buy it, the costs are such. Magnesium is so inexpensive 
you know, the bottle and the sprayer can cost more than the thing itself, uh, that if they buy the bottle, let's say the bottle was 20 quid, um, the person who's handing out the sachets could buy the bottle for 10 quid and they could double their money. So um, that's one thing that I'm doing. The second thing that I'm doing is that about seven years ago, it came to my attention uh, that bioresonance devices could be really useful. Bioresonance is where it was invented by the Germans about 30 odd years ago, and well over half of the GPs in Germany, I think, just have one on their desk. It'll tell you, just touch a little rod for a short period of time, and it'll tell you what your vitamins are, how much vitamin C you've got right now. It'll tell you what your zinc levels are. It'll tell you whether, uh, for instance, um, you've got heavy metal poisoning. It'll look at your heart and tell you, you know, 20 odd factors about your heart. You can see if your pH is right. You can see if you're getting enough oxygen to the brain. You can see, more or less, it's, it's like x-ray vision. You can see what it's like. And let's say you've got kids at home and you're wondering, are their mineral levels all right? You can test them or granny or whoever it is. Then you can say, well, I'm going to give them a really healthy meal. Let's see if it's made a difference. So you could give them a meal that's r rich in zinc, you know, pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds or seafood and so on. Then you could test them later on, see whether if their levels were low before, they're now high. Or if you're buying a supplement, is it working? You know, because some supplements you really feel and others, you don't know, it might take a few months before you, you, you get it. But you can look on, on this scanning device on your computer and you can see exactly if it's working. You know, let's say you, you want to raise your zinc levels, you can just test yourself. So as I say, these machines were thousands and I couldn't afford one. And I decided to have another look at it because, um, so about eight months ago, I bought one and I found they were way cheaper than I'd ever thought. I paid about a thousand and I thought, well, that's pretty good, but if only they could be cheaper. Anyway, I've uh, had one specially designed, basically, and it's made in China, and I can sell them for th 375 quid, these devices. Now, there's enough profit in it that there, uh, anybody who... I mean, let's say somebody just wowed somebody with the magnesium. Now that they explain, well, look, you know, here's this scanner, you can see everything. Um, there's a big profit that could be made for them as well. So, I mean, let's say there's a hundred quid profit to be made. I think if somebody said, if somebody who could afford it, look, for 375 quid, you, you'll know all your, even if it was just the vitamin and mineral levels, even if it wasn't able to look at their brain function and their heart and so on, if it was just testing that, I think there are a lot of people who, for the family, would invest in one of these things. So, uh, if anybody or you know anybody who might be interested in sort of taking that, that line, because it's, it's a small investment to buy one of these machines and just demonstrate it on your computer. And it, it really is a wow thing. I've brought one with me, so anybody who want, wants to see it or get tested on it, I can test you all if there's time. Probably not all, but I can test, test a number of you, and you can see what your levels actually are. It's quite enlightening, and um, uh, it can be a bit shocking because you suddenly see in very graphic terms, oops, I haven't been quite paying attention as I should be to my health. The first time I, you know, I got tested on one of these machines, it was a shock, shock to me, because I thought I was reasonably healthy. I'm no saint, you know, I do the bad stuff as well as the good stuff, but I try to do more of the good stuff than the bad stuff, but I, I got a shock, you know. But the, the incredible thing was, um, uh, the first page that opens up is, is about the heart, and mine was all over the place. It took me, uh, only two weeks to get to get it all straight down in the green. Um, it, it's surprising if you know what to do, how quickly you can turn yourself around from being you know, really, really unwell to, to fabulously healthy. Sometimes it takes a long time, but, but it can be much quicker than you think. And uh, okay, uh, my website is called clivedecarl.com, and um, I've done a host of videos where I've done things like interviewing people who've been curing autism, uh, ophthalmologists who've been reversing blindness. Uh, I've covered quite a lot of the subjects and I just, just basically, it's easy. I just interview the best people I can find in the world. And uh, some, some of them are just stunning. I mean, really, really life-saving information. And uh, if you just put Clive to Carl onto YouTube, you'll find them all. Um, I've got to sort of catalog them a bit better so they're a little bit easier to know what, what's in each one. A um, couple of other things, just, just if you want to wake people up, uh, ask them what's in front of their face or ask them what's not in front of their face. 
you know, the older you are, the more you'll remember that if you went on a long drive, that you had to stop after an hour or something like that to wipe all the bugs off your windscreen. It's like Armageddon on your windscreen, all the dead insects. Now, I can almost guarantee you there'll be no insects on your windscreen because they're all dead. Right, 99% of the insects in England are kaput. They're not there. If they were, they'd be dead on your windscreen, and they're not. Okay, so it's right in front of people's faces, extinction, and people need to wake up because the last time I looked, insects had quite an important role to play, and they're not there. Well, when did this first start happening? Well, I used to have an organic farm, and it was in southern Spain, and I left the farm about... 13 years ago, something like that. And I went back the following year and I was sitting, having a glass of wine with my friend and he said, uh, do you spot what's different? And it took me ages until he, he, he pointed out, he said, said, it's the moths. Now, in the old days, there were fireflies galore, beautiful fireflies around at night, they disappeared. But what was really shocking was, you know, they, they, you'd have a light on at night There'd be 500, 1,000 dead moths and insects who were attracted to the light. And then in the course of one year, there were about seven, right? They're all gone. And it had to be, what could it be? Well, it could be the mobile phones, but there was no big change then. It could have been the introduction of Tetra or something, but I'd never noticed any moths going up. Had had to be uh, the um, agricultural pesticides, you know, fungicides herbicides, insecticides, whatever. It had to be. I couldn't see any other explanation for it. So, because as an organic farmer, I was making more money than everybody else who was growing with the chemicals, and I was doing less. It's a farce. But unfortunately, most uh, farming is subsidized on, on behalf of the chemical industry, so they get really cheap, cheap chemicals. When Spain joined the EU, uh, I was chatting to my local farmer. He just killed an entire field of uh, almond trees. I said, what had happened? He said, well, um, uh, the EU, just we just joined the EU, and now we get cheap chemicals. Uh, 50p, the equivalent of, for a 25 kilo sack of chemicals. And because more is better, he'd used double and killed the entire crop. But, um, you know, subsidised chemicals, it's just not, not the way to farm. So, uh, also, I do consultations for people uh, if they want it. Before I do what I did now, I used to do hypnosis, and I still do that if people, people need that, if you want to change something about the past, it's usually very easy. Um, I do workshops, you know, whole days of this stuff, where you can get into it in more depth and ask lots of questions. Uh, but I am going to be around today and tomorrow, so, you know, anybody can grab me and ask whatever, whatever they need to ask and uh, vast quantities of money are always gratefully accepted but not actually necessarily needed. Um, has anybody got any quick questions that, that you want answering now? That are... yeah. I would like to say about the pharmaceuticals. I agree with you that the doctors only know what they did. Why the other way No. When the, uh, as far as I'm aware, what Clive said about the pharmaceutical and uh, the doctors, they only know what they've been taught. It's true. And when they go, when I go to see the doctor, say, and I tell him what my problems are, and he looks it up on his computer and all the information. All the information he's got comes from the marketing departments of one of the largest criminal networks known in the world. So you may want to consider whether what he's telling you might actually be true. <laughs> well, quite right. I mean, you know, only go to a doctor if uh, they're doing non-invasive diagnostics on you. Uh, any of the tests that involve, you know, anything f physical doing, just don't do. You know, they, they put radioactive dyes in people and stuff. You know, when, when I suddenly became really ill, um, uh, they did a, did a test on me. And then afterwards, they said, oh, by the way, don't go near any babies or young children for 24 hours. I said, what do you mean? They said, oh, we just injected you with a radioactive dye and you mustn't go near babies or children. I said, I've got four young children. What are you talking? Well, I don't know, four then, but, you know, I had young children, but they just injected me with this stuff without even telling me anything. You know, I wouldn't have consented having radioactivity shoved around my veins. 
and they do all this stuff and y you know you think it's safe you, you want to put a doctor on a spot ask them what the LD50 is the LD50 is LD stands for lethal dose so what they do is they t they take a new drug and the LD50 is uh, if people take it at this dose 50% of the people die that's what it that's what the LD50 means so the drugs companies say, OK, there's the LD50, half of the people die. We'll cut that by a factor of 10 and give a tenth of that amount. That'll be safe. Or a hundredth of that amount. That'll be safe. But, you know, why choose an LD50 where half of the people die when you give this drug? Why don't you choose an LD5 or an LD0 uh, as your starting point? So, you know... Uh, I'll sort of wrap it up now, but, you know, so much of what the doctors have been taught as, as just normal, you know, where, where you set a level where 50% of the people die, and that's all right. You know, <laughs> yeah. Just one, one last question. You talked you talk, you talk about vegetarianism and veganism. I think there's a lot of people here who, obviously, we've looked at esoteric... Um, you know, the, the spiritual, the material world, and the human being. Um, and, you know, the connection with eating animals, um, you know, potentially isn't, um, you know, a, a, a spiritually good thing to do, okay? I'm not trying to push a, an opinion forward, I'm just wanting to question what, what you said. You gave an example of one person who, um, you know, needed for whatever reason to, to continue to eat meat. You said that veganism is a difficult thing to, to make sure that you get the right levels of minerals and nutrients. But, you know, if someone is empowering themselves to, for whatever their personal reasons, to not eat animals, yeah. then they can uh, get all the nutrition that they need um, and, you know, and not is, die early. It's is very that? difficult. It's, I mean, uh, for instance, I would say that, uh, that, I mean, obviously our ancestors, when we were in tribal in the forest wandering about, we knew where everything was, we'd be eating seasonally locally and we would be virtual vegans. But <coughs> the best brain food on the planet is eggs, right? And they're so easy to find. Our ancestors, for sure, when there was n nothing growing in the winter, we would have been eating eggs. I'm convinced of that, and I think also. So you're saying that without, if you don't eat eggs, that you're going to get some brain disease. You could do. You've got to be because I mean, remember that to England, avocados, which would be a good brain food, olive oil, which would be a good brain food, were not not local. You know, what would you have eaten to get the cholesterol? As a vegan, yeah, you know, you got to you got to think. Well, yeah. So, so I, I think our ancestors did uh, use animals to, to even if it was to make milk or whatever, just to get through a cold winter. Cheese, you know, that that, that you know, it was only what 200 years ago that the Thames was frozen over for, you know, people would go skating on. You couldn't dig the ground because it was frozen solid for six months at a time. So. Our ancestors would have had to be pretty forward-thinking, uh, you know. So, so we, are, we aren't living in the time of our ancestors now. We do have refrigeration. You know, so well, one, the point I'm making is that you, I would, this, I would say that you, you can maintain a healthy well, diet no, 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 that no, doesn't no, involve no, eating yeah, animals. No, no, people do. Products. There are bodybuilding vegans who are 80 and fit, fit as anything, and there are a lot of others who couldn't make it. You know. Uh, uh, the, 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 the scientists say that we can't process vitamin C, right? Our skinny pigs and a few other animals can't process vitamin C like most animals can. But this is clearly not entirely true. Some people seem to be able to. Uh, so yeah, we're not all the same. We're all different. And I think that that has to be welcomed. I should say that uh, I, I very, very, very seldom eat meat. I don't terribly like the stuff. But I just rethought my, my position on it. Um, and but I wouldn't eat any meat that wasn't farmed in the most loving, humane way possible. You know, I don't want the adrenaline flowing. You know, it's like that. I mean, I met this hunter who said if he gets a clean shot of a deer and brings it down before it knows it's dead, whereas it would take, let's say, an hour to roast that bit of meat, if the no adrenaline runs, he's, he said it's cooked in under 10 minutes because, you know, and all the, all, you know, 
well, I don't need to tell you how awful animal farming is in this country. Mm. And also, all the animals are being fed soya, including the fish. And very good. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and and it's genetically modified. You know, unless you're buying organic, they'll be feeding the animals genetically modified soya or corn or whatever it is. And animals in England don't eat soya or corn. That you know, they're all being fed the wrong food. Now 90% of the cows or something like that are in factories. They're not in the fields anymore. They've never seen grass. They've never seen daylight. And you feed cows, for instance, a soya-based meal, which they're all getting these days, they're running a terribly acidic body. They're ill. They're seriously ill. So now you're eating genetically modified, acidified animals who died in fear. It's all ghastly. Yeah, everybody needs to support their own local farmer. Find somebody who's a genius at growing whatever it is, cut the shops out, go straight to them, give them the heritage seeds that you've bought and found, those tomatoes that taste absolutely dynamitely fabulous. Yes, they only crop half as much as a Euro tasteless tomato, but we've got to take a role of supporting the local farmers because the government is doing the opposite, trying to close them all down. You know, it's up, up to us to find the people who love doing what they're doing and support them. OK, right. talk to me later. I'm just going to say uh, on behalf of all of us uh, our gratitude for driving up here today to give such a wonderful, coherent, insightful talk. And as I said, it's right to question the men in the white coats. The, the only, you know, uh, the, the word for GP is general practice. General practice. Like the three things you should never practice is tattoos, haircuts, and the medicine that people are going to be having. So the doctor says, let me generally practice on you. Take this. That's weird, isn't it? The psychology of the words. I think they are. Can I just say yeah. one more thing? Uh, something else that really is important to know. 93% uh, of women with breast cancer have root canals. Right? There is an absolutely clear link between root canals and cancer. Not only that, but no surgeon on the planet would ever do an operation and leave dead tissue in your body. This would not happen, except mm -hmm. dental surgeons who, who leave dead tissue when they do a root canal. So root canals, if you've got one, you've got to either use a frequency device uh, to send frequencies in to kill infections that will be inside the root canal, whether you like it or not, or you have it removed. And the other danger, as I mentioned, is the mercury fillings. Uh, many, many people, you can go onto YouTube and you look in mercury fillings cancer, hundreds and hundreds of people saying, it's just three weeks after I had all my mercury fillings removed that the cancer tumour started to shrink. If you're thinking of having uh, mercury fillings, uh, silver fillings removed, do not go to the dentist to put them in. Go to one of the biological dentists and there are probably less than a dozen in the country or something who are any good. So, are you a biological dentist? Well then, speak to this man. He's 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 the most important person in the field. Let's support the artisans. <laughs> We're all going to speak to you in a minute. So, let, should we give one more round of applause to Clive Dakar for a wonderful talk? Thanks very much, Clive. And then we'll be back in about half an hour for uh, the plant medicine and the ethno uh, ethno botanicals. Cheers.